Hi, and welcome to the When Women Fly podcast. Each episode, I have poignant conversations with women who fly, run, surf, ski, climb, or otherwise soar, and possess a passion for life that is infectious. These are honest and insightful conversations about dreams and reinvention, often in the face of uncertainty, doubt, or other impediments. We talk about busting paradigms, grit, working hard, and playing hard, all while building a community around the empowering metaphor of flight. I am your host, Sylvia Winter, a pilot, runner, mother, skier, list maker, and apparently podcaster. I believe that when we share our stories, own our fears, and dismantle our perceived limitations, the possibilities are boundless. Whether you're pursuing your passion or simply love the idea of possibility and wonder, this podcast is for you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Let's get started. My guest today is Kim Havel, one of the all-time best mountain athletes out there and a woman I am honored to know. She balances working in the stunning environment of Jackson Hole, Wyoming as a mountain guide, professional skier, real estate associate, and mom. Outside Magazine named Kim as the preeminent female ski mountaineer of our time in 2012. She was listed by Backcountry Magazine as one of the 37 most important women in backcountry. She has a lineup of past and present sponsors including Salomon and Osprey. Kim has skied on all seven continents with first descents on four and has adventured in over 50 countries. During her travels, Kim has climbed and skied peaks in the Himalaya, Andes, and Americas. She has first female descents on Wyoming's legendary Grand Teton's Otter Body and became the first woman to ski guide the Grand. Her list of adventures runs on. Unlike many of her peers, this powder girl didn't grow up skiing in some snow-capped Mecca like Jackson Hole. Instead, she was born in Tehran, Iran, and grew up in Hong Kong until she was 12 when she moved with her family to New York City. It was city life. She ski raced and rode crew in high school and as a student at Brown University. This, incidentally, is where she and I overlapped. After college, she headed west to Telluride, where she coached ski racing, became an ambassador and ski model for the resort, and joined the San Miguel Search and Rescue. This is where her passion for the mountains flourished. This episode is an affirmation to do what you love most and must do, and you will not only meet people who share your passion and know your devotion, but will lead you to great heights. Kim is humble, witty, ambitious, strong, determined, and a lot of fun. Enjoy this conversation. Kim, I'm so psyched to talk to you today. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, it's so great to reconnect. Thank you for reaching out. Yeah. You are not the typical powder girl. You didn't grow up in the Rockies. Your parents aren't on the mountain ski patrol or mountain guide. So what were your early influences? So I grew up abroad on an island and my father's childhood, I think, is what influenced me initially the most because he had a passion for being outside and for skiing and rock climbing. And that trickled down into our family vacations. And so we'd head off to the mountains and go skiing when we could. And that always stuck with me. So I had a foundation there and it really grew when I moved back east to New York City. And we went to high school in New England. Yep. And then onward to college. And what were expectations of you if there were any during that time as well? You did go to Brown's, not a shabby college experience. You know, when I got to Rhode Island, I kind of continued to pursue the sports that had already intrigued me in high school, which was namely skiing and rowing. So I continued with both of those. And that was a great outlet for me. I think I discovered pretty early that I found a lot of happiness and joy with being either on the water or in the mountains. So I was Mm -hmm. able to continue that for a while in Rhode Island. And I was pretty free. My parents were not very present. My dad was abroad most of the time that I was growing up. And my mother's not really in the picture. So I had a lot of freedom, which for better, for worse, for better, I really had to, it was a sink or swim scenario. So I chose to uh, swim as hard as I could. I just had the opportunity to really pursue what I wanted to with full freedom and full opportunity, but I didn't have that support network. So I had to do it on my own. 
And you found sport to be a supportive community? Yeah, I think, you know, definitely starting in high school, being on a crew team, uh, all those gals became great friends and threw into college. Same with the men's team. And we all bonded still to this day. Some of my closest friends are on the men's crew team from Brown. We just did a Zoom call the other night that was pretty entertaining. And same with skiing, even though it's a very individual sport, there's a lot of teamwork involved. That's also leads into backcountry skiing and partnership is a huge part of that. And I think having those friendships is, can be like family. Mm -hmm. And from such a, you know, relatively early age, your ability to be on a team and be a team player seems so evident in choosing both crew and and skiing because you are, it is a team when you're out there on the mountain together and all the things you have to endure for that couple of seconds of the race, right? (laughs) Absolutely. And everything counts to the bigger team's equations. I also think it's neat to reflect on those two sports, which, you know, you continued high school and college with those two sports. But now, and I even wonder now if you were to go back in 2020 and would you still be doing two sports or would there really be an emphasis on single sport at that age? I think it's an advantage, right, to gain the strength and for your body and for injury prevention. But I don't know, have you reflected on that from the the advantages of those two sports, which are very different, I would think, on the body? Yeah, I think rowing is low impact in many ways. I mean, people get injured, but I think oftentimes it's in training or I feel like the injury rate is a lot lower. (laughs) Skiing, it's a lot higher. But rowing brings, there's a strength of mind that you have to have in that sport. Erg tests were one of the hardest things still to this day that I've ever done that you have to dig pretty deep. And so when you get into things like ski mountaineering, you can play on those sort of learned Mm skill set that you've gotten from the past. And it really helps with long days, grinding it out in the mountains, whether you're slogging in or out, and it all kind of overlaps really nicely. You had sort of early grit training there. So after college, you headed west. Yep. And what drew you there? You know, it was a variety of factors. I think I initially wanted to move to Whistler and I couldn't get the visa that I needed. And I'd spent a summer there previously and was really taken with the Canadian environment and mountains. And so I started looking around the U.S. and a few different things fell into place. Namely, there was a film, Blizzard of Oz, that played into that decision. I loved how Telluride was depicted in that film. The people mostly were the draw, just this real hippie vibe and very inclusive and you could be a freak and everyone was accepted. And I just this overall inclusivity that I felt from that. And I really, that drew me. And then I had a best friend in college whose uh, family, her parents were in music and they played in Bluegrass Festival. She had ties to the community from that. And so she said that she wanted to move there. So it all started lining up and Mm -hmm. she and I moved out to Telluride together. And what was your entry into mountain life, mountain living there? I was full on right from the start. It's in back, that was back in the sort of mid to late nineties. It was still very much a hippie town and a very small town. Everyone was extraordinarily friendly, not clicky, just again, inclusive. It was exactly as it was shown in the movies. And so our first day when we arrived there, our roommate was a very well-loved person in town and was starring in a, in a film called Scrapple. And she said they needed extras for a pig chase scene. The gal that I drew, drove out with, so we got dressed up in 70s clothes and got, got to meet more or less half the town and had the time of our lives. And it was sort of full throttle from that point forward. And when did you start really entering into the mountaineering and the climbing scene there? I'd say pretty much right out of the gates. Well, it took a little bit of time. I was a ski coach for the first year amongst numerous other jobs. So through ski coaching, I met great people in the community, great skiers. And from there, I then met a a boyfriend who had a lot of talent in the big mountain environment. And so we started doing more exploring together. Then I also sort of, once the, i felt the bug essentially to get out and do a whole lot more. I just started calling around and asking people that I was starting to respect a lot and hearing about and seeing if they would take me along. And then it just progressed from there. Mm -hmm. And when did you start doing sort of big expeditions? That started in 
more or less the international travel started in 2006. Mm -hmm. I was on the search and rescue team in San Miguel County for about 12 years. And I got on the team probably, I think it was one or two years into moving into to town. That created forged great friendships and gave me incredible training and resources. And a group of us from that team went to Nepal fall 2006. And that was sort of your entry into the traveling for the mountains? More or less on that level, on the big, big mountain level. And was that for film or was that for being sponsored or that was just an opportunity that you... I had some sponsorships at that time, but that was just for pure passion and desire to try and see what what we could do in that environment. And it was a a tremendous trip. It didn't, for some of us, it went a lot smoother than others. However, Mm -hmm. I'd say big picture as a team, we did extraordinarily well. It laid the foundation for my decisions to pursue that end of things to come. Again, I think a lot of it came down to the teamwork, the friendships we'd build. We had the infrastructure there to understand one another when things got really hard. And we always knew someone had our back and was sort of a seamless adventure in an environment that can be very challenging when you're with people that you know exactly what to expect from and you know that they'll take care of you and vice versa. Because you had the background of working together for those years in, in Colorado. Yeah, we've done so many rescues. And-, and then you've had, subsequently after that, you had experiences that were in contrast to that as far as the team goes or just your overall experience. Can you speak to that? It's hard to make these trips happen. Financially, it takes a tremendous amount of resources. And time-wise, it takes huge commitment. Finding the people to go is also a challenge. And I had such a passion for it and a desire to pursue high-altitude mountaineering and skiing that I sort of started to embrace any opportunity that came along and really pushed hard to make some trips happen and getting grants and really, I think, extending it as far as it can be extended and going on trips with people that I did not have that background with and did not have that understanding with and trying to build those relationships in occasionally extremely high stress, dire circumstances can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So that happened to me a few different times. You know, I've, I've had the chance now to have a lot of retrospect. Would I change going on those? Probably not because I'm so grateful to have seen those places and to have had those experiences. I think we probably would have had a lot more success with them if we'd known each other going in. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those things, there's opportunity and then there's experience. And it's some people are lucky to be able to go with the same teammates all through their career. But the companies I was involved with didn't give me the financial support to do that. So I had to go out and search for opportunity and it didn't always line up the way it should have. Mm-hmm. Did you do solo traveling during that time? A little bit. When we got, I got done on a trip off Shishapangma and did some travel around Nepal by myself after that trip. That was really rewarding. A lot of times you're flying in and out at different times. And it was a, that was a pretty tough trip. And uh, I was flying home to tell you, right, I think it was Thanksgiving. This is the stuff you hope builds a lot of character. We, I was on the plane, I think it was Kathmandu to Delhi. The guy comes over, the speaker, the pilot, and says, we don't have enough fuel, so we're going to make an emergency landing, adding insult to injury. And then we land in Delhi, and I was like, well, this is an opportunity. Maybe I'll get to get off the plane and go spend a day. And didn't really line up because of visas and blah, blah, blah. And then when I got back to the States because of the delay, I had to spend Thanksgiving in a hotel by the Denver airport on my own, which was fine. I mean, it just makes you stronger in the long run, I guess. So with that trip specifically, for instance, so how long would that trip have been from when you departed to your expected return? I think that was about two months. Okay. The big trips take of that nature. I mean, things have now changed with if you have the money and if you have the backing, you can get into the hyperbaric chambers and train early and kind of cut off a lot of that time. But without, again, resources like that, you're going to log a fair amount of time up front acclimatizing and Um, moving camps up. And usually all our trips, the trips I've been a part of have been pretty bare bones. We haven't had many Sherpa or any on-mountain support. We carry all our own gear on and off. 
we do have usually someone helping us at camp and we have porters br- help us bring our gear in, but we've even no oxygen. I haven't used any oxygen on any of these trips because that costs money too. Like you kind of have to cut out, that's an mm-hmm. extra $500,000 to have the extra O2 at camp. And so you kind of scrape by as best you can. Mm-hmm. And things are done really differently now, aren't they in, in general, or just you have options to do it differently now? I don't see as, I'm, I might be a little out of the loop, but I haven't seen as many of these types of trips going on. Again, it's just so expensive. Mm-hmm. You need to be part of a larger company to make it go. And if they do invest and they usually have the resources, you have a lot of staff helping, you have a lot of infrastructure, you have a lot of supplies there that you need. I think things have changed in terms of, again, how you can acclimatize and get prepared and so forth. But I just, I think the prices are still going up. Mm -hmm. And for you, what were some of the biggest mental, their mental challenges, their physical challenges, sometimes they're interrelated, but what were some of the biggest mental challenges for you in that? Again, I'd say it's that teamwork scenario going in with, I'd say mental challenges. We're trying to figure out ways to navigate differences of opinion or safety margins with people you didn't know that well. Overcoming feeling like at times you're alone. There are a few times I had to do some hiking in and out on the glacier and back into base camp in the dark and by myself not because of any falling out or anything, just because the way the team looked at things, everyone kind of split up, which is never my MO, but it happened. So there's mm-hmm. things like that. And then we had things that went truly wrong. I, I fell in a crevasse on Shishapangma, but that worked out, obviously. <laughs> I got really lucky on that one. And then we had the tent next to us light up, heat up a propane scenario and that exploded, but they were all fine. And then we had on Shishapangma, we had one of our teammates Long story short is that one of the locals, Nepalese, came in with us and disappeared for about a week, one of our our cook, essentially. And so we spent a week trying to look for him. He had to get from base camp to advanced base camp, pretty easy walk and pretty straightforward. He never showed up. We did a lot of high altitude searching at a very rapid pace, and that made one of our team neighbors pretty ill. I felt pretty compromised. I was very upset at night. We were wondering if we had real threats to think about and worry about. And it's a very long involved story, but he ended up showing up. We never understood exactly what happened, amazingly. That our teammate had to go to Kathmandu. I think he had, he was dealing with a little bit of pulmonary edema and a blood clot. And so he was out of the trip. And then there was just three of us left. And we had gotten pushed to our max for a week, you know, running up to, 20,000 feet from 16,000 feet looking all around, just trying to search every, you know, and lots of up and down elevation. And we got pushed hard. So there are things, those would be big mental ones. And then physical ones, overall, I've generally experienced pretty good health on these trips. Mm -hmm. I've adapted well in the past to altitude. However, on some of these kind of circumstances, that one, I got pretty sick afterwards and made some calls into a great doctor friend, Dr. Hackett, based in Telluride. And got on a, a few different meds to to get through that and then had to and then continued on with the trip but you know there's both sides the mm. physical high altitude side is not i mean if you are acclimatizing correctly and listening to your body you generally shouldn't be suffering that much you should be going at a pace that allows you to adapt to the environment and then therefore feeling better all the time mm-hmm. and my understanding is that there's no way to really know how your body's going to respond until you are in this situation. It's not a direct correlation with fitness. No, definitely not. It, interestingly, I think I saw that on that very first expedition, Ahmed Ablam. Some of the strongest guys I've spent time with were racing in, you know, on the hikes and everything else. And I don't think that paid off in the long run. I think it took a toll. It, you can be the most exceptional athlete in any other thing, scenario, but you really have to listen when you get into the bigger altitudes. Right. You're humbled for sure. Yeah, definitely. And were you the only woman on that trip? On the climbing team. Yeah. We had two girlfriends that came in that were, that just did the trek with us and then went back to Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. And I really want to ask you about this. Tell me about skiing. We'll shift a little bit to skiing, skiing on Mount Etna. That was, it was really fun. It was an interesting that was fairly casual <laughs> in its own right, because, you know, you're in Italy and 
you're in Italy above a beautiful town and you're going down for cappuccino afterwards. But Etna was beautiful. I still struggle a little with that episode we we made. I got a fair amount of criticism for that. But the guys, the filmmakers involved were are some of the best out there. They're very creative minds. And so they asked each of us to play a role. And I'm not enacting for a reason. I really tried to to play that role hard. And it really, I think it succeeded it to the extent that I did what they asked, but the way it blended into the ski episode was not as ideal. I came off pretty silly, but I had a great time on that trip. And uh, Solomon was wonderful for sending us on it. And it is a very wild volcano. The fact that things were moving when we were on it was pretty exciting. Never really a threat. But. Had you expected that? Sure. You always think something's a possibility in the realm of possibility, but it, it definitely added a whole nother fun flavor to the experience. So just to be clear, you and your team are skiing down an erupting volcano? More or less, yep. Or rumbling? Yep. It decided to have some activity. Yeah. It's crazy. So in general, in that time, you just, you traveled a ton and it had to be more than the mountains that you were exposed to, the people, the culture. Were there other events, other experiences, travel experiences, adventures that from a cultural perspective were really eye-opening? I know you went to Morocco. I mean, you've been skiing and or climbing on seven continents. So Tell us more about some of the really extraordinary sort of cultural juxtapositions between these Americans that are coming over to, you know, do what they do and the the mountain people that call it home. Yeah, I think that welcoming attitude is what's most pervasive, that it's just, I can't think of a spot from Pakistan to Morocco to anywhere in the Andes. People are excited to have tourism. They're excited to have visitors. In some of the communities in the third world, you're obviously adding a lot to their economy by visiting. They welcome you with open arms. They try to invite you into their culture. In Morocco, they bring you in for tea. Same in Pakistan. It's The world is a very friendly place. And I think when we as visitors embrace that and, and visit in peace and in kindness and welcome those gestures and, and go into these homes and talk to the people and learn more about their perspective and their experiences in their own towns and how it feels to them to have people come in is very eye-opening. I think the hardest thing often is to come back. I mean, I grew up abroad too. And I think for me, coming back to the States and trying to remember those moments and incorporate them into your everyday, the trying to remember gratefulness most of all. I think being in in Kenya was one of the ones that sticks out the most. We did a project with, I did a project with two extraordinary gentlemen, Jake Norton, uh, Wendy Valentine's husband and high school friend and Pete McBride, who is also an exceptional talent. And they put together a film called The Water Tower. And we traced the water from Mount Kenya down to Nairobi, more or less. And going into the slums was part of that experience where they live off the trickle of water every day. You know, they fill up one bucket each and trying to remember what it saw to see kids playing in the sewers and try to figure out a way to give back in your own personal way or make an impact on that. It can be extremely overwhelming. And the feelings I had were so, I can recall it every day when I think about it, were extremely strong and powerful, but what do we do with that? And where do we go? And how do we conduct ourselves? It makes things like posting on social media feel very silly to me sometimes, in particular, as I get older, trying to find ways to impact is, is difficult. And I have friends that are, were in the mountain community and still are, but are now finding really extraordinary ways to get involved with the places that they visited and give back directly, mm-hmm. which is tremendous. Well, especially when places have such a profound effect on your being, you know, spiritually and emotionally, it's, and it's hard to not connect with the culture. Yeah. And realize how, what privilege we, we sit in. Yeah. So your wandering spirit was in Telluride. You traveled quite a bit. Skiing, obviously, was a big part of you and, and your life in Telluride, which we haven't really spoken much about. But tell us more about your, you didn't really race after college, did you? 
No, no, I have no future in racing. <laughs> okay, so, 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 so unpack that transition from, <laughs> you know, getting out to Telluride and, um, you know, Telluride, you know, there's there's some big mountain out there. Well, let's see, I, I got to town and started ski coaching and then basically had to learn how to powder ski, which was I mean, I don't know, maybe a good two years. Jeez, it was a long time. And that for me right now, guiding is still a very strong foundation for the work I do with the friends and clients I work with, because I very much remember how it feels to not feel very good at something in skiing. And I also remember how hard I had to work to get it. I don't think I was very natural at learning it. It's something I absolutely adore now, obviously. <laughs> but so I started powder skiing and then that kind of led to being inspired to go out of the gates and then of the, the backcountry gates off the resort. And then as that, I sort of logged more time out there. I then started wanting to get into ski mountaineering more. It really spoke to me as a sport and to where I was at that point in my life. I, I loved it and it filled my day with tremendous happiness and it gave me a real sense of self and it provided me with a lot of confidence at a time where I think I really needed to grow some. Just getting out of bounds has, is more than just getting out of bounds. Yep, absolutely. And then you were in Telluride for how many years were you there? I get it wrong every time. I think 14 or so. Oh, really? Yeah, that long. Yeah. And towards the end of that, I know that you and your community there experienced a lot of loss. How did you process that and, and move forward? Well, it wasn't just in Telluride, the avalanches that all occurred. Some were Telluride too, and then some were outside of. They just, all of that sequence of events all happened within, I think it was three months. I basically got off Mount Etna and got the news that my friend Nate Souls had passed, and he had a young family. And then it progressed to from going straight from Etna to with the gal. Elise, who was on that trip to going to Stevens Pass and doing a clinic for Solomon there. And then I left to go teach another clinic at Alpenthal for Osprey Pax. And that day that I left, they all went skiing and Elise was caught in that Stevens Pass slide. Sort of kept going from there. And then I went from Stevens Pass back to Salt Lake, where I just moved and felt pretty uh, lonely and extremely sad. And to say the least. And then I came up to Jackson because a good friend of mine, Steve Romeo, invited me to just hang out and kind of regroup and was a friend from the mountain community. And I stayed with Steve and we had, were planning an expedition that spring to Baffin Island. So he and I went skiing a couple days and had a fair amount of tears on the skin track. And I came back to Salt Lake and I was out with a photographer up on Superior, Mount Superior, and got a call that Steve had just died in an avalanche. And it progressed from there to another friend. Yeah, so the cycle kind of continued in a way that felt really right. And it, it, it all touched me. And it took, I think I, I probably still I'm realizing, I don't know if PTSD is the word, but I, it took a long time to get through all that. Mm -hmm. And how did it change the way that you approached your sport or adventure or risk management? I don't know that it did exactly. Obviously, you have a very heightened awareness, but I feel like that happens to me every year I'm in this sport. I gain more and more of that perspective and you just learn more and more. But that following year, I went on to do more in a season. I had just gotten to be a full sponsored athlete, so fully supported salary and all that. And I was in my mid 30s, which is, you know, your dream shot in your mid 30s and you just lost a lot of friends and it was a very interesting thing. And I was starting over in a new community, new communities, plural, and didn't always make the best choices. I think I was really trying to find my way and it was hard on my own. So the loss, I just, I think I thrust myself into the mountains. I found two really great friends here in Jackson that I really saw eye to eye with. We had a similar outlook in the backcountry. It was very quiet, quiet friendships, if you will. We had a lot of fun, but they're very low-key, mellow people, cool cucumbers, I like to say. And so we just went out, and it was very safe season, and just skied. You know, I think we did a pretty big line almost every other day for a lot of the year, and they were psyched to do it, and I was really excited to do it, and I had never really done a lot here. And so I just, and that really speaks to me. I love exploration. I love 
seeing new things. I have a lot of curiosity. And so I just kind of went for it. And I think I found some healing there. It wasn't directly dealing with the pain itself, but I got lost in the environment a little bit and it helped me get through some tough emotions and process, allow me some time, built in some time to process things that I just couldn't figure out how to break down and separate and get through mm -hmm. in one big bunch. Yeah. Sometimes mentally we, we just go in the circles and just got to physically, there's some outlet in, in the doing the hard things that create some relief. And you're being very humble and not talking about any of your first descents, but tell us about how that factored into at least your, maybe your period of rejuvenation during that time or just finding what you needed to find in Jackson. There weren't multiple in Jackson because there's been a lot skied here. The things that were, there was the first of a female skiing the otter body route, but that wasn't the driving factor. It was just something I really wanted to ski. It was the culmination of a long season of watching that as I skied other things around. And I haven't always had the obsession with the Grand Teton. A lot of people have. I was just getting to know it as a mountain moving here. I'd already, I'd come up to ski it years before, but it kind of was just a very cool experience from way back when. And so once I started spending more time here, I was very intrigued at trying to do more options, ski more lines off that peak. That was the most obvious one for that season, for where I was and where my partners were. The overall going after goals and sizing things up is a really fun project in and of itself. You learn a lot assessing snow conditions and being on things every day and getting that mountain mileage. You were the first woman to do first descent on Otter Body. Tell me how the labels of first female, what that means to you. You know, there's always the discussion of whether it matters or not. Does it matter to you? It does. I think, I wish it didn't. I wish it wasn't something we had to record or be aware of, but we have to start somewhere. I think women have had to come from behind. We haven't been given the push or the opportunity or the chance or the, I don't think society really believed in us for a long time, which is obvious because we got the vote late and all that sort of thing. I think it shouldn't be something that's, I think it needs to be noticed and it needs to be of record, but I don't think it's this great, huge thing. It's just, to me, it's sort of a turning point. Okay, let's go. We can do this. We are equally capable and we have an even playing field, but if no woman goes and does it, then we don't. And I do at times, I bristle a little to the like, the dialogue of good job boys or all that sort of thing. I get it. And it's great. But I also, you know, in some of those environments, you know what, we can do it too. And we are doing it. It's dismissed a lot. And I want that to change. And I am now, I do see some great women in this community that are going to really push things down the road. And, you know, again, already on equal footing and we'll be doing bigger and bigger descents. It just seems to take, I think there has to be acknowledgement of it out loud that women are accomplishing the same things. And then let's move forward. We don't need to dwell on it. It's, you don't need a trophy. You just need to acknowledge it. And then, okay, open season. Men and women are both doing this. We can all do it. Let's do it. Right. <laughs> More yeah. doing, right. <laughs> Equals. It's really equality. It's, yeah. I think we have to, it's a small niche. Nobody even knows about this sport in the world overall. But the more women are on the same platform, the more it changes everything. You know, I think that will affect salaries. It'll affect, it really is significant that women notch those equal accomplishments to men so that we are seen in the same light and given the same opportunities and people trust in us, female pilots. Are you worried that your pilot's a female? You shouldn't be. You should actually be more relaxed. Right. Um, and that's a great segue actually to talking about being a mountain mom and what that, meant when you added the role of mom to your resume and all the delights of delights and challenges of having a little person in your life. Yeah, I think I go back to the the story of my start really that I had all this freedom to thrive essentially. I had all this freedom and no guilt to go out and explore. I I had a distance from my parents and to a certain extent physical and actual. And then I lost my brother when I was right when I first moved to Telluride. We were a year and a half apart. 
so at that point, I really was on my own. And I, it gave me this chance to, I didn't have anything that was sort of tying me down. So I could go out and thrive and not be, my conscience wasn't worried about other people worrying about me. And so then becoming a mother, I think that was probably my greatest shift since kind of experiencing this total sense of freedom. My husband is gone six months of the year, more or less. We're seeing more and more of him now, but we're involved in the outfitting world and run pack trips and hunting trips. And so he's gone in the wilderness a ton. And so I was really, the first couple of years, I've been raising her for significant chunks of time on my own. And so I think trying to find the balance has been extraordinarily difficult. I'm getting there, but it's taking time. I also feel that sense of obligation of, I chose, we chose to bring a human on this planet. I want to see that through and I want to do that right. And I've been with people who had children in their thirties that I went on trips with. And I learned a lot from observing their experiences and their choices and how that went for them. And I think when we decided as older, we're older parents to, to do this, that really I wanted to do it right. So I've had to forego some of the things that really drove me for a long time. I'm slowly but surely getting back to that point, but are my decisions affected by this? For sure, when she was an infant, no question. I did not feel comfortable, I'd say, pushing those margins, but I also didn't have the opportunity to as much. And I'd say now that she's getting older and is a little more stable and going to kindergarten next year, I feel a little more sense of, okay, mom, let's go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's go get some of those things you've been thinking about for the past few years and make some more dreams happen for me that my adjusted goals of what I feel comfortable with now. Mm -hmm. And you have a group of moms. Tell me about the mom force. The mom force are really extraordinary women. It, it kind of started very innocently. It's still innocent. A friend's wife, who's, he's a ski guy. She approached me and said, Hey, you know, I feel really cut off from doing stuff I love. Can we maybe figure out a way to get a group together and go out every week in the backcountry? And it progressed and we now have a group of eight women and I now have another group that's starting off of this of four or five more. The goal is, is to, number one for everyone is safety. Number two is to ski powder. And number three is as the season goes on, last year we were able to, push everyone's boundaries a little more. And I think that was really one of my initial goals when we all got together, but it wasn't really at the forefront of their minds. I wanted them to feel and experience what I have experienced and walk away with some of the gains that I got from testing my boundaries and experiencing cooler skiing and skiing off a big peak and the challenges of getting up a really hard skin track and all the things that you endure out there, even though you have children and a job and responsibilities, all these parents do, all these women do. And I think that was, that for me was one of the greatest gifts of my career, walking away from a few of those days where they accomplished, it overcame an incredible amount of fear, worked through that and accomplished pretty big goals that they never even knew they could have. The mom force is, you know, there's no pressure. Start out nice and easy every season and see where it takes us. and. But it's allowed all these women to kind of find avenue in skiing that I don't, I don't think they knew was open to them and available to them. Mm -hmm. That's rewarding for everybody involved. I think it's really powerful to have a set weekly commitment too of to just get out there and you arrive however you arrive and you take it from there and uh, just the community too, right? That is builds from that. I think everyone gains and that transfers into, or at least we tell ourselves it transfers into being a better mom and all those other things. I think it does. I really do. I think there are some women who I love the honesty and the openness of the group. And they, a lot of them have said it out loud for people who have written stories and so on. But some of them were experiencing a tremendous amount of anxiety or this or that. And through their day in the mountains once a week, walking away from the job, walking away from the kids, what they've had to release a lot of that. And I think getting out of that immediate experience and going into another place allows you perspective that you didn't have before. They come back much stronger. And I think they've all taken on challenges that 
might have seemed more daunting to them before. Mm -hmm. It's sort of as if that's a muscle to exercise that muscle of confronting that fear, the challenging thing and realizing you can get to the other side, especially in community. Yeah. Well, you can, yeah, the friendships forged on this. I mean, even through, I mean, I've, these gals have all become very dear friends to me now. And I think the experiencing that exhilaration and those challenges makes you delve a little deeper in yourself. We get lost. I do too. These, you know, some of those days early on with Charlie really make you forget that you even know what you're doing in anything outside the house. <laughs> I don't even feel like I know what I'm doing in the house sometimes, but it <laughs> getting it just, you need a reminder and you'll not give yourself that reminder sometimes because something else will come up that's more important. And if you are forced to go and do that every week, then you're reminded, oh yeah, I'm a lot more than I was. 10 minutes ago in my house trying to get a diaper on or trying to potty train or trying to get a meal together or whatever it is. Sometimes when the, when my kids were really little in that age and I would have a break, I would sort of like literally sort of introduce myself to myself again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, hi, how are you? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> yeah. Well said. Yeah. So, uh, nice to uh, meet you again. Let's go for a run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and I wanted to segue a little bit into social media and navigating navigating what social media means. When you started in the mountains, and I think probably with your first big mountain trips, I don't think there were cell phones, or at least there wasn't Instagram, you know, and now a lot of what's done is defined vis-a-vis -vis the, the posting, how you navigate that and how what your take is on it. Well, I don't think I do it very well, but, and I've recently taken a pretty big break because I've just been too darn busy. And I also just wanted to feel, remember what it felt like to not think about getting something out there. I love to write for magazines and stories and so forth. That to me is a different type of creativity. And I love doing that, but the daily or weekly or whatever input into the environment, like here's a picture I've kind of trended more towards reflecting just what I'm doing with my family than trying to promote myself in sport, which is actually probably a more accurate depiction anyway of what's going on right now. However, I'm not, to me, you know, and touching on what we talked about a little earlier, you know, after you see enough things in the world and after you've experienced enough things, it's to play the game, to me, it feels like a game a lot, is really hard. It feels like I'm compromising a fair amount of myself to come up with the things the environment wants to hear, the promotions the companies want you to do, it feels like a lot of compromising. And I did just watch that film, The Social Dilemma. <laughs> I'd say it didn't, a lot of it was eye-opening. A lot of it's stuff I think we all already recognize and know, but that was sort of sparked me to step away a little bit and kind of drove something I was already kind of doing anyway for a bit. I'll get back in there shortly. But I had an interesting conversation about a week ago with one of my main sponsors, Solomon. I've been on that team since 2006, 2020. I've had various different roles over my lifetime with them, but you know, it's really great to talk to, to them. They're, they, every company now is driven by all the, the numbers, that, the matrices that they're analyzing and the algorithms and this and that. However, for some of us, they, a lot of our involvement is just now to be authentic is authenticity. I hope that's what comes back around. I, I miss the days of, I mean, many, most of my days in Telluride, we didn't, there was nothing recorded. Occasionally I'd put, I like taking pictures too. So I'd post a photo here and there of our excursions because it's really cool and fun and fun to share, but the overall promotion of it started to get away from me. I, it's just worrying about taking pictures. A lot of the time, I'm guiding a lot of the time now and I do take photos for folks and I enjoy it, but trying to capture something to present to people later is dangerous. It's not, it takes away some of the fun of the, the moment. It just shouldn't be what drives our decisions, which is obvious for many too. But so I think it's a dilemma. I do. I think mm -hmm. social, and it's only getting stronger and a lot of people are only getting better at how to work with it. They also present really inspiring and really great things. And it's allowed me to connect with friends from a long time ago or staying in touch with people. I'm still talking to some of our 
the folks that were involved with expeditions in Pakistan. And it's all through Facebook. And it's pretty cool to be able to communicate like that. So I think everyone finds their own healthy balance with it. And for me, it's been really great and rewarding to walk away for a little bit. Yeah. So give your give yourself permission to. Yeah. Yeah. Take a step aside. It's going to roll on no matter what. So, <laughs> but speaking of this, you in January of this year captured an avalanche. Well, it was this year, correct? Yeah. Explain that because people probably haven't seen it and what you were thinking and feeling when you saw that. It was a very spontaneous thing. You know, I think, again, being involved in search and rescue and being in the mountain environment for as many years as it's been now, you see things happen and you respond. At that point, I had a, I was skinning out or not, I, I was skiing out with a group. We'd just gotten done skiing in a back canyon. I was ahead of the group because we were kind of skate skiing out and getting into a place where I could just wait for everyone and watch them come in. I turned around and was just studying, like you do, what was happening on this big peak across from us called Taylor Mountain. Just saw the initial fracture happening and my phone was in my, in my pant pocket far away from my transceiver because they will interfere. I pulled it out and just started recording. I don't know, it was just a very quick thing and I did see the whole thing start. I was not concerned, honestly, because I had studied the face. I, my, you know, I as a lot of people ask me that, were you freaking out? Were you scared somebody was in it? Were you worried about doing a rescue? For me, I, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. It's sort of one of those blink moments to me that I was looking at the face. I was seeing the tracks that were already in place. I knew what was happening in the environment. All those things came into play to my mind that I was pretty sure it was not human triggered, that there wasn't somebody in it, that I was not watching someone in the avalanche. Mm -hmm. So just kept recording. And then when it was done, I was done and skied out with the group. And then I met search and rescue and the sheriff and all that back at the, it's the same trailhead for those two areas, but, and then shared my opinion and perspective. But of course, they're going to run the helicopters and make sure the site is cleared so that bring up transceivers and do the reco and, and clear the area to make sure nobody was even below and hurt. But mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, it was kind of a non-event event. It was pretty wild to, to watch it. But, you know, in Telluride, Heli company Helitrax goes over and you get sometimes fair warning that they're bombing the end of the canyon. And so get to see avalanches a fair amount. So the tracks that you had seen, you didn't think they were fresh enough that that, that those people were in danger? No, they were pretty fresh that day, perhaps even afternoon, but it wasn't somebody right on the slope at that point. It was, it, it was heat. It was tremendous heat at that point. And the hour, it was close to three o'clock. Mm -hmm. it, it had been cut. And so it was sort of primed and ready to go with the right external factors. And those external factors came in with the right amount of heat and so forth. Mm -hmm. It was just this hanging. It was ready to go. The decision making that day, I was asked a lot about that. The people that mm -hmm. skied the slope, some of our best, one of our best guides was one of the people that skied it, but much, I think, much earlier. And he chose a safer route on off of that general area, one where there are immediate exits and what we call islands of safety, ways to get out of there. And then there were some people that I think skied it close to one o'clock, maybe, but three o'clock is past the tipping point in my mind. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, another avalanche happened in the spring in the exact same area at almost the exact same time that avalanche released. The, it was not, it was a fatality and it was extremely sad and it was a local. There's some question marks on that, on what exactly happened. You don't want to be starting down a big line in warming temps at three o'clock in the afternoon in the winter or the spring. Mm -hmm. General idea. And did you observe that this COVID spring that human behavior was more or less rational than, than other springs? I didn't personally see any things that were extra, extraordinary, people stepping way out of bounds. I think there were a lot more people out there because the ski area was closed and probably a lot more people with a lot less experience. But it was one of the best ways for people in our area to feel a sense of normalcy. Can't rob anyone of that. I think we all... We're looking for any way to get outside and 
feel good and healthy and not leave some stress behind. And so, no, I didn't see, I think some of the things that come from wanting to ski were the parking situations and some of that kind of thing weren't ideal. Some of people's behavior in and out of areas, like giving people appropriate distance or turning your back or putting a mask on or whatever. We didn't have a lot of masks at that point, but people are using buffs and all that. So I think some of that behavior could have, you know, I think we're all improving as we go. And that's the direction we need to go and respect, respect overall, respect and kindness. (laughs) This is a podcast where we celebrate the spirit of taking on challenges and reaching unimaginable heights. It's about passion and pursuing that passion. Is there one thing that you wish you knew or advice you would given would have given yourself at a younger age? I'd say to believe in myself more often that I think we all, many of us are our own worst enemies in that sense, that we hold ourselves back. If you're doing it, you're doing it. Believe in yourself and try not to criticize yourself. And I think that will allow you to grow that much more. Yeah, it's important. You mentioned Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Are there other book recommendations that you might have or some anything you're reading these days? I am reading a book right now that it's taken me a while. We got in an Exum training, Exum Mountain Guide training a couple of years ago. A gentleman came in, a mountain guide from Canada, who'd been through a really difficult avalanche experience. And he started with some information from this book. And Black Box Thinking is actually about questioning authority and being always willing to openly accept your mistakes. I think it's an absolutely fascinating book and it goes into much of how I look at things and some of my experiences that if you're in an authority position, you absolutely have to listen to everyone that's not. And if you are not, you can't be afraid to question authority. And I tell my clients all the time, I am guide, not God. And if you see something or you think something or you feel something, you need to tell me. I don't care if you think it's silly. It, everybody's opinion, if you sense something, I want to know about it because we have to listen to that inner inner sense. And this book speaks to that, that you, we, in many industries, we don't improve because we're not willing to listen to criticism. We're not willing to question ourselves. We're not willing to learn from our mistakes. Medicine is built on that a little bit, and the airline industry is not. Aviation does a lot of work now to learn from mistakes, and that's why aviation is progressing at a very exponential pace to relative to, say, medicine, where it's very hard for a doctor to say, oop, I messed up, because then you get sued. So anyway, it, that's what I'm reading, and I think it might make it for interesting reading for people that are looking at questioning and acknowledging mistakes, and how it ultimately is, how do these people that are most successful, how have they gotten there? And it's ultimately because they can admit when they've been wrong and learn from it. And iterate and update their mindset, probably, their approach. Yeah. Yeah. What do you have on tap for this winter? Yes. Uh, some more guiding internationally in the spring, if we, if that seems like the thing to do, if bound borders open up, et cetera. And uh, a lot more guiding and hopefully some personal projects in the Tetons, various presentations and camps and clinics, things like that. How can listeners find out more about you, Kim Havel? Google? I don't know. That is one way. I can guarantee you that one. But you're being shy. You have a website and you have an Instagram feed and you have a number of sponsors and outfitting companies. Yes, I am Kim Havel at most things. If you want to talk, I'd love to chat. So reach out anytime. And yeah, hopefully I'll be writing. I just finished writing a few different pieces that I have. It's been a little bit of a hiatus. So excited to be getting back to that. And hopefully I'll start posting some photos here soon. Awesome. It's been an honor to receive a glimpse into your life, Kim. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Sylvia. Thank you for listening to the When Women Fly podcast. My hope is that you leave this conversation with a sense of curiosity and empowerment to hold on to what is important and let go to what weighs you down. Stare fear in the face. If you like this episode of the When Women Fly podcast, be sure to share and subscribe and let us know what you think. We love feedback. Be brave, be bold, and fly. See you next time.